Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our webinar Wednesday program coming to you live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for contracting with the Defense Department. We've been moving sequentially and we started with DFARS Part 201 in January and we will be finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. So if you do have questions for our speaker, um, we will have her information on the last side of the presentation today. And a special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition for making these webinars possible. The NVSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTAC can offer. Set Aside Alert provides up-to-date news, information, and opportunities for small business federal contractors. Their daily opportunities alerts assure you won't miss important sources sought and solicitation announcements, providing details so you can jump on the hot ones. Every two weeks, they deliver concise breaking news, events, regulations, and teaming opportunities. And please join the Reston Chamber of Commerce Government Contractors Council for regular meetings. Please contact Alicia Fields with the email shown on the screen if you do have any questions. Federal contracting is a relationship game. Now get in front of your federal human sooner with the exclusive players and layers method from Judy Bratt and Summit Insight. Connect with her on LinkedIn and find out more or visit growfedbiz.com today. If you are interested in selling to the federal government, you may need a contract vehicle. The most popular one is the GSA schedule. Learn more about the requirements, the proposal process, and how this contract vehicle may or may not be the right tool for you. Jennifer Schaus is teaching a series of classes, as you can see here, with the Virginia PTAC and Mary Washington University. All classes are listed on our website under the events section with the registration link. Okay, and now a little bit about us. Um, we work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. And our services range from market analysis reports um, to contract vehicles and compliance, and more information can be found on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 23,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. I also wanted to inform you of a new series that we're holding this year in 2021. Um, we have launched a monthly series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe, and this is a live webinar series held each month. Um, and these will take place on the second Friday of each month this year at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. Um, and these panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen and then take your live questions about that topic. So, for example, our panelists covered subcontracting last week. And next month on um, June 11th, our panelists will be covering sales and capture. 
Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, and other industry professionals. And you can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Sponsorships are available, and you can email hello at jennifershouse.com for a media kit with pricing details. Also, please note that you can use code DFARS for a $15 discount on each of these webinars. Okay, and now to introduce our speaker, Sarah Nash. Welcome, Sarah. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Great. Thanks, Hunter. Um, hi, everyone. I'm glad to be speaking with you today about a fun topic. I work with Polaro Mazza in the labor and employment group, and we often deal with uh, labor and employment in the government contracting environment. And there are a lot of similarities that you might come across just in the commercial world, but there are some really big differences. And so we'll go over some of them today. Uh, not all of them. Honestly, we could talk about labor and employment issues for government contractors for hours, but I'll try to have just a concise sort of summary for you. We'll briefly touch on some specifics that are mentioned in the DFARS. Um, and then hopefully, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Um, it's a broad range of topics. So hopefully a lot of this stuff is going to be relevant to the businesses that you specifically are working in. Um, generally, we deal with anything from labor and employment, uh, wage and hour issues, hiring and firing decisions, decisions as you know these can be very different in the government contracting space because you're dealing with you know the government customer um, but we're going to focus specifically on some of the issues that are mentioned in the DFARS that deal also with labor unions and employee organizing um, so we'll talk about some fun stuff today next slide Specifically, we're talking about DFARS Part 222. This is the application of labor laws to government acquisitions in specifically the defense space. Um, next slide. What are some objectives for today? Specifically, we're going to go over what's in the DFARS Part 222. It's important to always read this in conjunction uh, with the corresponding procedures, guidance, and information. If you happen to have a copy of 222 open, you'll see that there are a lot of references to PGI um, just to help um, with some specifics about who you're supposed to contact or um, how specific uh, instructions are supposed to play out. It's impossible to discuss DFARS Part 222 without discussing FAR Part 22, which is the overarching uh, regulations for labor in acquisition work. And so you'll notice that a lot of uh, the time that we're talking about these issues, we can't discuss DFARS without specifically looking at what, what's in the FAR. Um, DFARS is much shorter uh, than the specifics in FAR Part 22, and it really kind of fills in any defense specific issue. We're also going to briefly touch on some big pitfalls that uh, contractors or that CEOs might fall into as they're uh, looking at these issues. And ultimately, one of the things you'll hear me repeat over and over again is you want to make sure that you're reading the FAR, reading the DFARS, just so that you know what's in them. Because it's very frequent that contractors will assume that they know what's in there or assume that they know what the rule is, but it's not. Um, so, again and again, read what's in your contract, read what's in the DFARS, and that'll save you a lot of headaches down the road. Next slide. So, what does DFARS Part 222 uh, look at? It's looking at labor laws uh, specific to government acquisitions. This is going to deal with not just um, employment side issues, uh, such as prevailing wage issues, but it's also going to look at the labor side of issues, labor union issues. Um, and you're dealing specifically with general policies that are related to labor relations. Um, and it's important to remember that this is not all uh, of the regulations that relate to labor and employment. For example, 203, which you discussed, I believe, earlier in the year, deals with whistleblower rights of employees, um, FAR part, or DFARS part, 223 is going to deal with some drug-free workplace issues. And so this has the bulk 
of uh, regulations that are dealing with your employment force. But for example, if you're working in HR or you have um, issues that you're worried about employees, this is not the end all be all. There are some other uh, sections that you're also gonna wanna look at. That said, this does have most of those needy labor and employment issues in it. Um, so generally, the FAR and DFARS provides a blueprint for how companies, and in fact, how uh, contracting officers um, are supposed to navigate the acquisition realm with respect to uh, labor and employment issues. And then it also, as I mentioned, includes a lot of instructions for COs specifically regarding what they're supposed to put in the solicitation, how they're supposed to take action. Um, you'll realize as you go through some of these regulations, as we go through them today, uh, there's a lot of, there's a balance here, right? You have two things primarily that you're balancing when it comes to labor laws in the government acquisition world. One is keeping uh, DOD, keeping the government happy and um, making sure that the trains run on time, right? Especially with defense contracts, you're dealing with a lot of national security issues potentially, and you wanna make sure that you're not compromising national security or uh, DOD prerogatives uh, with some labor issues that could have been avoided. On the other hand, uh, Congress has made a decision that they want to prioritize employee rights in the government contracting space. And so just because you're working for DOD or a government customer doesn't mean that you can compromise necessarily all of these employees' rights and um, obligations that are owed to employees. And so a lot of what we're going over, you'll notice that it's trying either um, creating a carve out for national security exceptions or making clear that there is no carve out and that uh, you really need to focus on obeying uh, the legal requirements laid out either here in DFARS or in FAR or more specifically in other um, legal obligations that exist out there. As I mentioned, it's important to always review your contract, review the solicitation, make sure on the one hand, if you're a contractor, that you know the obligations that you are contractually obligated to. A lot of these obligations are creatures of contract, which means if they're not in the contract, then they don't apply. So it's always important to read, read, read the contract. If you're a CO, you want to make sure that you're reading uh, the regulations to make sure that you've put out the right information. Next slide. So it's really difficult to go over GFARs without having kind of a broader perspective about the issues that are addressed within FAR Part 22. And this is a very long, complicated uh, FAR part. It deals with anything from um, prevailing wage obligations. For example, under uh, the Davis-Bacon Act and the Service Contract Act, there are a lot of uh, prevailing wage obligations on what you need to pay employees if they're working on a specific contract that's covered. Um, you also are going to deal with uh, equal employment opportunity issues, anything from affirmative action requirements, um, veteran discrimination issues, um, standard race, age, uh, gender discrimination. These are all encompassed by FAR Part 22. You're also going to deal with uh, overtime obligations and convict, convict labor restrictions. Um, you're going to deal with minimum wage requirements. As hopefully everyone knows, there is a different minimum wage for contractors than there is under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So as a contractor, you're obligated to pay a minimum wage to all employees who are working on or in connection with a federal contract. Um, you're, it also deals with sick leave requirements that can attach depending on the type of contract you're working on. Uh, so this is a broad scope. Uh, a broad um, spectrum of issues. I think there are 21, 22 issues that are covered overall by FAR Part 22, and DFARS works with those in conjunction with those um, provisions. And so ultimately, to determine what's in your contract, you're going to want to look at what's in the solicitation, what's in your contract, to make sure that you have considered 
all of the different requirements because they're not all common sense. And a lot of them do specifically apply in the government contracting space um, and can be really unique um, obligations that you might not necessarily have thought of if you haven't been reading uh, the contract to see what's in there. Next slide. So the first issue that's addressed in DFARS is kind of basic labor policies. And this section deals head on with this question of balancing employee rights against uh, DOD needs and prerogatives. And so when you're working on a defense contract, often you're working with employees who are unionized. Or if they're not unionized, there's the potential that they may in the future want to become organized. Uh, suppose you're working with um, one of the uh, professions that's mentioned specifically in deep are stevedoring. It's often a unionized workforce. Stevedoring involves loading and unloading cargo from ships. And so in that uh, type of work, often you're going to be dealing with a unionized workforce. And when you're dealing with a unionized workforce or you're dealing with a workforce that is considering becoming unionized, there is the potential uh, for labor disputes whether it's a, a strike or a work slowdown or um, trouble with negotiations, these are all issues that can impact the work that's being performed. And just because this is a government contract, just because it's specifically a DOD contract, does not mean that you get to ignore a lot of those obligations that are placed on employers under the National Labor Relations Act, which is the law that specifically addresses this addresses unionized uh, labor and working with employees um, in a collective bargaining and a collective action context. So there are some things though that you have to do specifically when you're working um, kind of adjacent to a labor dispute with the government. You have to make sure that you're very clear in your communication. If you catch wind of the fact that there's going to be a strike, if you think that it will impact your ability to complete your contract, you have an obligation to let the labor advisor, the contracting officer, and the head of the contracting activity, whoever that is, know that the work may be interfered. The labor advisor is, every agency has one. They are responsible for, they're first of all, they're, they're general attorneys. They're going to know the ins and outs of FAR Part 22, FAR, or DFARS Part 222, and they will be able to advise you on obligations that are specifically addressed therein. Um, obviously, you need to be in touch with your contracting officer, and here it specifies the head of a contracting activity to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. In certain circumstances, uh, the contracting officer or the head of the activity will request that contractors submit a strike plan, which goes over what is the company's plan for if there is a strike, how the work will be completed. Just because employees are going on strike doesn't mean that um, your obligations to complete the contract evaporate. And so figuring out what your backup plan is for when your labor force goes on strike, things like that. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you are in touch with the right people in the event. I don't know how many folks on the line have a unionized workforce or have dealt with uh, union issues in the past, but it's important that you have communications be open. There's also a provision in here specific to DOD that uh, accommodates for the situation where specifically if employees are or a contractor is responsible for um, removing materials uh, from a facility, in some circumstances, it's going to be really important for national security or whatever purpose that these materials continue to be removed. In that, in, in that circumstance, the CEO can't just go in and say, okay, we're taking over, we're getting this out of here, or instruct regardless um, that the contractor remove the item because it could involve violating certain labor laws. And so in those circumstances, there is an instruction specifically within the DFARS, it's 222.1014-4, that they have to coordinate with 
of the FMCS. And the FMCS, Federal Mediation Conciliation Service, is essentially a mediation agency that is available, not just in the government contracting space, but that helps um, labor unions and employers reach consensus on um, issues that might involve work stoppages, it might involve um, negotiations, but they're supposed to facilitate that ongoing relationship. And so there's an instruction specifically within the DFARS to help avoid um, a work stoppage from really uh, messing up uh, the contract requirements. And so they have certain steps that they have to go through. I mentioned Steve Adoring earlier. Um, there's also specific instructions for dealing with a labor dispute related to Steve Adoring services. Again, these are often unionized, so you want to make sure that you're reading that section. Make sure, assuming it's in your contract, that you've complied with those obligations. Next slide. So another another issue that comes up often in the government contracting space um, is the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act, and sometimes it's referred to as CHWISA and it specifically deals with overtime obligations. And if you're familiar with working in the commercial space, uh, the FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, already imposes an obligation on employers to, regardless of size, to pay employees who are non-exempt under the FLSA. Um, those are generally those hourly employees who are performing um, sort of work outside of the specified exemptions. It is an obligation to provide those employees time and a half for any hours worked over 40 in a work week. That's the federal requirement. Some states uh, impose additional requirements. For example, if you're working in California, there's an obligation to pay employees overtime for any hours worked over eight in a day. Same goes for Alaska. Um, but generally, the federal requirement is overtime for hours worked over 40. Chawissa uh, repeats that requirement specifically with respect to laborers and mechanics. And so no laborer mechanic or mechanic is allowed to work more than 40 hours a week without being compensated time and a half. Uh, often we'll get qu questions from clients who are um, concerned because, for example, their contract might specifically say no overtime. And that's pretty standard if you're uh, working uh, on a government contract, but there's a provision in there that says you can't work overtime, depending on the type of contract, on fixed price, what, 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 whatever it might be. And it's important, though, to keep in mind that just because your contract says no overtime doesn't mean that that obligation disappears. You still have an obligation to pay employees time and a half for any hours worked over 40, assuming that you had reason to know employees were working that time. And Chawissa specifically applies an additional penalty for violations, and it's a liquidated damages that applies $10 per day for each day of the violation. As you can imagine, this can add up really quickly if you have a, a lot of employees who are working, I don't know, 42, 45 hours a week and not being paid that additional dollar value. Um, this DFARS provision specifically addresses uh, issues that are uh, that the CEO must um, deal with when they see a violation of Chawissa. And it takes away some of the discretion that a contracting officer might want to show um, contractors who have run afoul of the law. And the requirement under this provision is that the CO needs to immediately withhold funds that are available, uh, provide the contractor with written notification of the withholding and a statement of the basis for the liquidated damages. Um, the written notification also has to inform the contractor that it has a 60-day appeal right. And if the funds that they're withholding are insufficient to cover the liquidated damages, the CO must ask the contractor to pay voluntarily. And that's, I mean, it's not really voluntary, 
but instead of Ruth holding from your payment, they'll just ask you to write a check. Uh, this is this is a must, not a may, and it's imposing a obligation for contracting officers in the defense space to specifically impose these obligations. Again, Chewisa doesn't apply to all um, non-exempt employees. It's just those laborers and mechanics, uh, but liquidated damages just can't add up. And not only are you going to be looking at Chewisa penalties, you're also going to be looking at the FLSA penalties, assuming that um, issues have been um, employees have not been paid for full time. Just because you're in a contracting space doesn't mean that those commercial obligations just disappear or evaporate. Those are still going to be there. Next slide. Another big part of FAR Part 22 and DFARS 222 are labor standards that relate to construction. So whenever you're working on a construction contract, there are going to be additional prevailing wage obligations um, that apply to your workforce. This construction, it's not just the standard construction you think of, it's also gonna to apply to alteration, repair, including painting and decorating of public buildings and public works. Um, Generally, the CO is going to be obligated to be putting the necessary FAR provisions and the DFARS provisions in your contract. So when anyone's bidding on a contract or a solicitation, make sure that you're reading to see whether it calls for construction work. Um, there are very specific requirements that attach when you're in a prevailing wage construction environment. You have an obligation to pay employees a prevailing wage. You have an obligation to submit certified uh, payroll. Um, and so it's not something that you want to step into without having really learned about it to make sure that you're dotting all your I's, crossing all your T's. And whenever you are dealing with specific Davis-Bacon requirements, you're going to want to also make sure that you're paying employees weekly. It's one of the bigger requirements. And there is a requirement that you, there's a Copeland anti-kickback statute that essentially says you can't require employees to pay back any of the money that you've paid them as part of satisfying the prevailing wage. So, for example, if you pay a prevailing wage, uh, suppose the requirement is $15 an hour, you can't then recoup a portion of that money by um, requiring that employees pay you back five dollars out of that 15. That's a big no-no in the government contracting space. Uh, believe it or not, the reason that this law went into effect is because they were noticing that a lot of uh, companies were asking their employees to pay back uh, the prevailing wage that was required, uh, often because it's higher than employees might have otherwise received on commercial projects, and um, they got away with it for a little bit, but it's a big no-no now. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, there's an obligation to pay a prevailing wage. Not just addressing wages, though, there's also a prevailing fringe benefit. Um, and under the Davis-Bacon Act, unlike under the Service Contract Act, which I'll discuss shortly, you can interchange components. So if you want to pay a little bit more in wages, a little bit less in fringe, or a little bit less in wages, a little bit more in fringe, you can um, adjust those values so long as the overall amount is equal to the prevailing wage. Um, you also don't need to separate these fringe versus wages out on your payroll. It's enough just to um, have the full amount. Remember, you have to pay fringe under DBA, David Bacon, for all hours worked straight time and overtime. Um, and a big important thing to remember about data bacon is you have to submit weekly certified payrolls. Under the DFARS, they specify that if for some reason you're not submitting the standard uh, DOL uh, wage form for certified payroll, it's uh, WH347, 
I believe, if you're not submitting that standard payroll summary, there is an obligation on, on DOD contracts to submit a DD form 879, just basically a statement of compliance that says that you are uh, complying with your Davis-Bacon Act requirements. Failure to comply with these obligations can end in some really disastrous consequences. Uh, the DO or the CO can withhold from your contract. They can suspend or debar a contractor. Um, and this is something that is enforced by both DOL and the contracting officer. Um, so it's really important. And it doesn't just apply to prime contractors, it applies to subs as well. So if you're a prime contractor with a sub performing David Bacon work, you want to make sure that you've slowed down all the FAR provisions, all the DFARs, to make sure that that subcontractor is also following the requirements. Failure to comply, failure to pay that prevailing wage, or to um, put the right information on those certified payrolls can result in liability under the False Claims Act. It's really important in this context that you're following to a T all of the Davis-Bacon Act requirements. And there's some uh, specifics in the DFAR is about how the CO is supposed to go about um, investigating violations. Uh, just know that those are in there. I'm not going to go over each of the requirements, but the important thing to recall is the CO really has to follow. Uh, they can't just look the other way. The CO is also on the hook and has to be um, performing these investigations. And so just it doesn't require essentially it doesn't require just the DOL investigation it could also come from the CO. Next slide. So I mentioned the Service Contract Act not only does DFARS deal with construction it's also dealing with those service contracts. Um, service contracts um, is any contract within the U.S. or the U.S. territories where the principal purpose of the contract is to provide services through the use of service employees. Generally, when you're thinking about service employees, it's gonna be janitorial staff, nurses, uh, clerical work, any employee that is performing non-exempt work, um, generally those hourly folks are going to be covered by a service contract. Again, it has to be the principal purpose of the contract is to perform the service contract work. Uh, it ultimately comes down to the CO on whether or not to include the SCA requirements. If they're in your contract, though, you have to make sure that anyone who is um, paid an hourly rate, who doesn't meet those FLSA exemptions, is compensated um, at the prevailing service contract act labor rates. Um, the CO, again, is responsible for including that in there. However, if they mistakenly get it wrong, the DOL will not hesitate to tell them to incorporate it into the contract. Um, so just because it's not in there doesn't mean that DOL isn't going to be upset um, if they come and investigate one day. Um, that said, assuming that it's not in a contract, then there's no obligation, at least on the contractor, to provide those rates. You really need to be looking for the Davis or the Service Contract Act uh, are provisions and the wage determination. They both need to be in there. Um, there are some exceptions um, where the Service Contract Act does not need to apply. There's no overall DOD exception, though. So if service contract, um, contracts apply in the DOD space just as they would in a civilian space. Uh, you also need to pay not just wage and fringe. There's a lot of other uh, obligations, holiday obligations, vacation holiday, vacation obligations, um, just some quirky rules that pop up. We have entire webinars, seminars devoted to talk on the Service Contract Act. So I'll just touch briefly here. Um, we're not going to get into the weeds, but if you do have questions about a SDA contract that you're working on, feel free to shoot a question after the presentation. Next slide. I'll also mention that under the Service Contract Act, you're going to see a few different types of wage determinations. There's going to be an e even wage determination, an odd wage determination. Um, 
it's important to understand the difference between those two when you go to pay fringe benefits to your employees. Um, sometimes if you have a collective bargaining agreement in place on the work site, that CBA will take over as a wage determination. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're paying attention to which wage determination has been applied. A lot of clients will often ask us, because they're familiar with the SCA workspace, whether they're supposed to automatically um, pay increases in wage determinations, because especially under the SCA, wage determinations are frequently updated. The DOL is, uh, the Wage and Hour Division is going out and reevaluating prevailing wages in different localities, and each time that they find an increase, or in some circumstances a decrease, they're going to update that wage determination. The important thing on performance, however, is that you're paying whatever wage determination is incorporated into your contract. As a contractor, you never want to be paying uh, something that has not been incorporated. So just because there's been a new fringe benefit rate or just because there's been a um, new wage determination rate issued by DOL, that does not apply to your contract until it's actually been incorporated by the CO. Um, you also want to, in this context, make sure that you're aware of the FLSA minimum wage, the EO minimum wage, um, and those obligations because just because um, for, for example, in some rare circumstances, I'm sure it's going to um, increase in the next year or two, but the prevailing wage is going to be lower than the EO, the executive order minimum wage that applies to employees of government contractors. In that circumstance, you still have an obligation to pay the higher of the two wage rates. Many of you may know that the Biden administration recently announced that they're going to be increasing the federal contractor minimum wage next January 30th, it's going to go up to $15 an hour. It's going to be really interesting to see how this $15 an hour um, aligns with a lot of the wage determinations out there that are much lower than $15 an hour wage rates. And so once that happens, you need to be paying the higher of any of those wage rates that apply. Um, while it's the CO's obligation to decide which wage determination is incorporated into a contract, it is the contractor's obligation to choose the correct labor category. There is a directory of occupations for the Service Contract Act that's issued by Department of Labor that lists um, dozens and dozens of different types of employee labor classifications. Whenever a contractor bids on a contract or bids on work, they need to be the ones who are deciding which labor categories are going to be used to, per to perform the work. Um, the directory of occupations is a little outdated in that a lot of the current um, labor categories in the directory of occupations don't encompass some of the newer age uh, work out there. In those circumstances, contractors need to fill out a conformance, uh, which is essentially a separate process where if you can't find the labor category in the directory of occupations, you find it somewhere else or you come up with a wage that applies. Um, again, you're going to want to be making sure that you're paying vacation, holidays, um, hazard pay if it's um, addressed in the wage termination, uniforms can also be addressed. Um, these are all issues that come up in the service contract labor standards. Next slide, and then I'll kind of summarize um, how the Service Contract Act and labor standards relate to um, DOD. Um, professional employees are not covered by service contract requirements. Uh, this means that those employees who are paid a salary basis who might fall under um, an exemption category under the FLSA. Those do not need to be provided with the prevailing wage rates. They don't need to be provided with FLSA overtime. Uh, they just need to be paid fairly and properly. Um, there is an, ob or there was an obligation. So the only reason I'm going to mention this piece is because there is mention in the DFARS of non-displacement of qualified workers. And it's, it's very sort of true to form for the DFARS. It, it doesn't really get into the details other than to say 
just a reference to the non-displacement issue, which might encourage some contractors to look at the non-displacement requirements. Um, previously, there was a requirement that um, SCA contractors hire employees who are previously employed on an SCA contract. Um, this is also known as the right of first refusal. Whenever a contractor kind of um, a follow-on contractor took over a contract, they had an obligation to make offers to employees who are working on that contract, on the service contract. That obligation is no longer in place. If I had to guess, I would anticipate that the Biden administration will eventually bring that back. So it's useful to know what it is. It does not apply now. Um, there are some exceptions to needing to bring employees back. For example, if you don't really um, need the full number of employees, say there are 20 employees previously employed, you think you only need 15 to perform the work, you don't need to bring all 20 back, you can choose 15 you bring back. Um, and there's an exception where the government has put in writing that they do not want a particular employee coming back. That said, this no longer applies, um, and so that part of the DFARS is a little bit out of date, um, but it doesn't really say anything other than look at your FAR provision. Next slide. One of the interesting um, pieces, at least to me, of DFARS is this next provision that we'll go over briefly. And this deals with determining whether the Davis Bacon Act or the Service Contracts Act applies to your contract. Often you will find both Davis Bacon and Service Contract Act uh, provisions in a contract, which means it can be difficult deciding which applies. And I'll give you an example of what might be an overlap where it's difficult to decide whether it's Service Contract or Davis Bacon Act. Um, for example, painting. Painting can be something that is performed as part of general maintenance, in which case it might fall under the Service Contract Act, or it can be performed as overall construction. Um, if you're building a new building and you're you know, going through and painting everything. This also can apply to some other different types of work. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's not a black and white question, but you need to be deciding and have a good reason for why someone is classified as a painter under the Davis Bacon Act or classified as a painter under the Service Contract Act. Because you'll notice as you look through these wage terminations, often it will be two different wage rates. And it's not a good answer to just say, well, I chose the lower of the two wage rates. You need to be thinking about whether the contract is principally for services um, and whether there's a construction piece, and if so, what the nature of that construction piece. And unlike other agencies, DOD has a really handy way for how you might determine uh, whether something is DBA or SBA. And it's the only agency that does this. And it's, it's so useful that sometimes other agencies will even look at this uh, rule of thumb to find out whether they want to classify something as SBA or DBA. And that involves looking at uh, sort of the square footage and the hours worked on a project to sort of have a bright line test for whether something is SDA or DBA. Um, to determine which applies, the DFARS specifies that you should review the following. Service calls that require 32 or more work hours are repair and subject to DBA. The idea there is that if something takes more than 32 hours, it's beyond just general maintenance, you're looking at construction or repair. Um, if it's fewer than 32 hours, however, they've said it's gonna be FDA. Same type of rule has been applied to paint work. If you are painting more than 200 square feet of um, space, there is a presumption that that work is subject to the Davis Bacon Act. And that's regardless of the hours worked. Clear line rule, 200 square feet, that means your DBA. Uh, 
Um, again, this is the only agency that has this bright line rule. It can be really useful. Uh, I think big part of it is often on installations um, for DOD, you're working with a lot of um, new construction and repairs, but also dealing with maintenance, and so this just makes it a little bit easier to follow along. Next slide. Um, I'll go over this briefly. There's a lot of um, equal employment opportunity issues discussed specifically in FAR Part 22. Uh, the DFARS addresses these uh, somewhat tangentially. The biggest way that they address them is saying, if you need a waiver, talk to this uh, contact at DOD. Um, so there's not really meaty provisions in DFARS, but it is important to remember that there are obligations uh, to comply with EEO uh, requirements. And the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Program, OFCCP, is the agency, it's a part of DOL, that's been tasked with uh, enforcing uh, equal employment issues. And this will range from anything uh, like a employee filing a complaint for discrimination. They also can file that complaint with OFCCP. Um, generally, in the commercial space, employees would go to EEOC. This just provides another angle that they can approach this from because there are requirements in contracts that contractors comply with certain um, non-discrimination requirements. And so the OFCCP will look into those issues. They will also look at affirmative action obligations if you have more than 50 employees and have contracts with uh, a certain dollar threshold, the affirmative action requirements require contractors to have an affirmative action plan. Um, similar obligations apply not just to uh, race and gender, but to sexual orientation and gender identity, um, and to under VEVRA veterans with disabilities and individuals with disabilities. Are, those are obligations that contractors have a need to comply with. Um, there's also an obligation to make sure that equal opportunity is provided and that contractors are including the EEO clause in their subcontracts and slowing down those obligations. Again, DFARS deal specifically with uh, where there might be a need for a waiver under these obligations. Generally, your waiver is only going to be available where there's a national security issue that really makes it impossible for you to comply with these obligations. Um, and if you are in a circumstance where you need to apply for a waiver, uh, they provide instructions for how to contact um, the individual responsible for making that decision. Next slide. DFARS also deals with combating trafficking persons. This is uh, dealt with in FAR Part 22 as well. Generally, it's just important that individuals do not perform human trafficking. Seems pretty straightforward. There are some interesting kind of um, aspects to the definition of trafficking, though. It includes prostitution, it includes domestic labor, and it includes manual labor. Um, regardless of where you're performing the work. And so even if prostitution is legal in a state, for example, um, this could still involve a violation of your contract if there are employees who are engaged in um, that human trafficking. It's important to recall that this applies to all acquisitions regardless of thresh dollar threshold. So this um, prohibition applies regardless. Um, generally, on contracts greater than 500,000, there is an additional obligation to create a compliance plan. Um, and this DFARS includes an obligation not just on the contractors, but on the CEOs to make sure that this type of trafficking does not take place. Next slide. There's also a section um, in DFARS on restrictions on the employment of personnel for work in non-contiguous states. And this is one of the few provisions that is not mirrored in the FAR. Uh, essentially, it is 
aiming to make sure that labor in certain uh, non-contiguous states is that the workforce of those states has an opportunity to provide the work on the contract. Um, it applies to not just Alaska and Hawaii, but Puerto Rico, the Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, Guam, et cetera, et cetera. Any work performed in these um, states or spaces, there is an obligation where there is an un unemployment rate higher than um, other parts of the U.S., there's an obligation to hire the local workforce. And this, again, is unique to DOD, I think probably because they have a lot of work that goes on in these specific areas and they want to make sure that the local uh, workers are employed and not displaced. Um, there is a exception or you can seek a waiver, but it's handed out on a case-by-case -case basis and it's only if it's in the interest of national security, perhaps the contract specifically needs um, a certain type of individual who cannot be found um, within those islands or states. Next slide. There's also an obligation, this is not um, mirrored in the FAR, but an obligation to comply with the labor laws of foreign governments. This is really just making it a contractual obligation because regardless, unless you're operating on a U.S. enclave, you're going to have an obligation to comply with the laws of the, the country where you might operate. And that includes not just the local laws, but any regulations, labor union agreements. Uh, the idea is that just because you are stamped as a DOD contractor, that does, that does not give you carte blanche to ignore a lot of these other requirements that apply internationally. Um, there's a specific indemnification provision that specifies that a contractor indemnifies the U.S. government from any claims arising under the requirements of this clause. Um, so if you're a contractor and you end up applying FLSA, for example, instead of the local requirements of um, whatever country you're operating in, uh, that comes down to you. That, that That is your burden to comply and the government isn't going to take um, credit for your decision to violate those local laws. So we always recommend it's important to be familiar with the local labor laws, local employment laws of the specific country where you're operating. Again, unless you're in an enclave, which can be um, a very uh, specifically defined space uh, where U.S. laws apply and federal laws don't. Next slide. Well, that sort of wraps up the specific um, issues that are addressed within DFARS. There's a couple other that I didn't touch on. There's a um, limitation on Limitations applicable to contracts performed in Guam that apply, that is in there. There's a restriction on the use of mandatory arbitration agreements that only applies to contracts that are one million dollars or more. Um, really, the moral of the story here is you want to make sure that you're reading carefully your solicitation. And once you've identified the specific FAR provisions or the DFARs, um, make sure that you read those as well. Hopefully, after listening in on this presentation, you have an idea of what to look for, um, you have an idea whether you need to be thinking about prevailing wages, whether you need to be thinking about um, affirmative action obligations, and now when you see those provisions, you'll know, aha, I need, to, I need to look at this law to make sure that I'm complying with my obligations. So never ignore provisions just because it doesn't make sense or it seems like it might not apply. You want to make sure that you're familiar with what it means and what obligations that might address. Um, you also want to make sure that you're flowing down the provisions necessary to your subcontractors. And when in doubt, contact your, C contact your CO, contact um, counsel, uh, and they can often talk you through questions you might have on kind of weighing that decision between performing on a government contract and making sure that you're still complying with your obligations to your employee workforce. Next slide. 
that's it for me. Um, again, please feel free to reach out. You have my email address there, phone number. Um, not currently in the office, but if you leave a message, I will make sure to call you back. And that kind of ties up our review of FAR or DFARS 222. Yes, like Sarah said, definitely feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Um, and thank you so much, Sarah, for a great presentation and for sharing um, your time with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this webinar. Um, the recording will be posted on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Um, and please join us next week as we cover more parts of the DFARS.